Hi, uh, today I'm joined by Alex Hudson. Alex is a fractional CTO and the author of A Practical Guide to Wardley Mapping. Welcome, Alex. Hi, John. It's Please. great to be with you. Thanks. Please elaborate on that and tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think probably what I preface that with is that I've um, been in and around the open source community now for about 20 years. And that's how I got into technology in the area that I work in. Um, and I, I currently specialize really in healthcare. So I work within the uh, healthcare sector with a number of different um, startups. And that's why I describe myself as fractional. It's not that there's only, you know, a few pieces of me to go around. It's that I share my time with a number of different startups working in healthcare, um, primarily using artificial intelligence in various ways, uh, looking at images, looking at text, um, looking at uh, signals, uh, biometric signals. Um, and it, it's an interesting area because it's one where you've got that confluence of technology and, and things changing rapidly, but also those constraints of the uh, approvals and regulations you need to get a device onto the market and the, the understanding of clinical users and, and the environment in which these devices get used. Uh, and that's really, I think, why originally I got interested in Wardley mapping was as a way of, as a product owner, and, and one of my CTO roles previously was a kind of joint product owner, uh, technology officer role. It was from that kind of product perspective, how do I identify what's going on in my marketplace, in my environment, and how do I try and make sense of all these different things that I see going on? So as part of your Wardley mapping journey, mm. uh, I can relate to what you're saying there about being a product owner, but can you recall any specific instances where you had a aha moment when you thought, okay, this framework, there's a lot to it, mm. but I can, there's something there which is different to what I've experienced in the past. And what was that? Yeah, I, th I think there's probably two key ones for me. And, and, and one of them I'd probably express as maybe a joint one. So I'll talk about that one first. Um, as I said, I'd started getting interesting in mapping, trying to make sense of a healthcare environment and trying to make sense, particularly of a, a customer that we'd begun to work with who are in the um, area of diagnostic radiology. So x-rays and CT scans, and MRIs and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and it's a, it's a very complex area and, and it's very highly regulated in, in a number of ways. And obviously from an outsider, uh, it's difficult to make sense of. Um, and, and one of the initial ahas that I had was uh, both working uh, on my own, but also working with my team, as we started to try and map out the environment, as we started to um, place the various components that we knew existed on the map, we could see gaps and we could see uh, linkages where there was a lot of discussion about whether it existed, whether it was from you know one component to another or where, whether it was another component. Uh, and that discussion, I think, was probably the first aha moment because it's about, okay, we found a way to identify things that are needs that we don't know about or we kind of suspect that they're there but we don't know quite how they're there so in that kind of Rumsfeldian language those you know known unknowns and the unknown unknowns you could begin to see gaps and you could begin to see things where you could you could see that your knowledge was lacking um, and that that's quite a, I think a powerful uh, side of the framework is that ability to not just write down those things that you think you know and talk about them but identify those gaps where you think that there, there are areas of knowledge missing and, and particularly in a group context that's very powerful and I think that was the first time I'd really identified that there was something here that I wasn't getting from other sort of structures so you know we do you know talk about the the SWOT diagrams and all that kind of stuff as not being particularly great I think that's one of those areas where you know if you're analyzing things with Porter's five forces or all those other uh, tools that are in the toolbox it, it's always difficult to figure out what those things that you don't know are and where they might be. Uh, so that was number one. I think number two, um, I'd begun to use maps to um, uh, sort of define the clinical landscape in a very specific way. Uh, in the UK, the NHS uh, has a kind of side body assist organisation called NICE, uh, who are the National Institute for Clinical Excellence. They talk about what good practice looks like in the, in the medical sphere. And one of the things that they do is they produce these um, clinical pathways. And each clinical pathway would be for a patient with a specific condition, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, let's say. And it will talk about the, the, the journey through the healthcare system, who it is they're meeting, what they're doing, 
what a doctor may be prescribing, what activities might take place. And, and all of it is basically an attempt to link um, clinical evidence. So all of those things that might come from, let's say, a Cochrane review of the evidence and things and say, OK, given what we know about what works and what doesn't work and what people should be doing, how do we relate that to an actual clinical environment and, and what might the variation be? Um, so beginning to map that kind of pathway onto a Wardley map, it's, it's not a straightforward mapping, but you can talk about, OK, I've got some different actors here. I've got a, a patient who is a user of the service in some sense. I've got a doctor who's using um, some aspect of this and, and wants to make sense of some of this information. And I, I can begin to talk about the transactions that are happening. So, you know, when somebody's prescribed something or they're booked in for an appointment or you know, whatever it is, they're making use of some aspect of a service and, they're, and they're, they're, there's a kind of highly transactional aspect to that in some ways. It's quite easy to capture within the map. Um, and, and what I found was as I was mapping out some of these clinical pathways, you could see those areas that were both uh, highly valuable from the perspective of the patient, but also those things that are potentially difficult to implement. Um, maybe they are reliant on some critical machinery or uh, like a, an x-ray machine or a ct machine or something um and, and all of that information when it came out in the in the map of the pathway and you could see okay there are these things here which are very highly visible and a, and a doctor and a patient are both going to be quite interested in these components it turned out actually that was a lot of um where the financial transactions and things were as well and then when you looked at for example uh, how reimbursement might work or how within the NHS it would get cross-charged from one area to another. It was very closely mapped to uh, where people were getting paid and, and where the value for the, or sort of not the value, sorry, where the financial compensation for the service was coming from. Um, and that was, it was very interesting to see that mapping because I, you kind of intrinsically expect in some ways that the more visible and valuable something is the more likely that that would be the most expensive bit of the service and that that's sometimes true but often it's not often the value is kind of under the covers um but it, it was definitely interesting to see that you could take you know a description of what best practice might look like and then infer other information about that service um and, and do that in quite a predictive way and, and when you have that ability to, I think, take some information that's in the public domain and be able to infer things that aren't in the public domain and be able to learn about things before, you know, for example, talking to a doctor and, and a consultant is always very difficult to get time with because they're expensive people and time is money. Um, you know, that, that's a very, that, that was a very valuable outcome for me. And that, that was definitely in a kind of an aha moment as well, because that was about saying, actually, okay, there are things that I can learn here, you know, just by thinking through, sort of some of the logical uh, implications of what has been written down elsewhere. Uh, and again, there's a framework for thinking about something there that uncovers things that you didn't know before. And that was very, very valuable for me. I'd like to go back and reference the point you made earlier about clinical pathways, I think. Mm. Uh, and um, see, I used to work as a developer within the pharmaceutical industry. Oh, really? One memory I have is, it's a long time ago, 16 plus years ago, uh, a memory I have is how slow progress is, mm. or it's perceived to be slow because of compliance and regulatory requirements and validation. Um, now, Woodley mapping is obviously a generalized framework. So I was wondering if you could, if we could look at the components of orderly mapping. So we have the strategy cycle, uh, mm. the value chain mapping, climactic patterns, and then con context specific gameplay. Uh, mm. And it obviously doctrine as well. Mm -hmm. And if you can, are, are there any aspects of those that link back specifically to healthcare? Um. Yeah, I mean, when, when we talk about the regulations and things, they, they're they quite easy to demonstrate in the maps and, and they show up as forms of inertia on, on particular components and particularly where you have things like uh, a pharmaceutical would be an obvious one, medical devices in general. Um, and I, I think there's an interesting way of looking at the world where you've got those constraints kind of on the map where you can say, okay, what are the things that I can do outside of those constraints or are there other things that we can do that are going to reduce the bottleneck on those areas of constraint? Um, so 
uh, going back to that sort of um, idea of mapping out a clinical pathway, in many instances, there are tests that you could do or there are, there's information about a patient, which if you had, you divert them down one pathway, one part of the pathway or another. Um, and that can be very valuable to kind of capture because you can say, actually, there are, there are parts of the pathway here which are much less uh, stringently regulated for different reasons, or in fact, you're doing something that's much less invasive. And, and that gives you a lot more freedom for um, that kind of short term um, let's do something with the service very, very quickly. And let's try and change things and see if those changes have the kind of impact that we, we would expect. Um, to, to give one sort of specific example here, we, uh, in the business that I was in uh, and, and where we'd started using some of this Wardley mapping, the, one of the key things that we were trying to give our customers a kind of a pro programmatic manner of um, adjusting pathways on the fly. So within clinic, they would within software be able to say, okay, you know, this is this is what my clinical pathway looks like, but I'm going to define that in software so I can then change pieces of it. And some of that pathway, I, I, I want to make very difficult to change because there are regulations or things around it. So for example, uh, if I'm doing an MRI and I'm, ingest, I'm injecting some contrast, some of that contrast is radioactive and you know, injecting radioactive substances into people tends to be a highly regulated area. So you don't want to touch that, but maybe there are other types of patients where, okay, they're going for an MRI, but you don't need to administer contrast. And the earlier you get that information and the quicker you can act on it. And, and, and if you can act on it in software, that then gives you an ability to uh, change things that you're doing within clinic uh, for that subset of patients and then see if those ideas that you have about um, maybe different ways of triage, different information collection steps, doing things in different orders, uh, then, then pan out. Um, and I think what it means is you, if, you, if you have some of that um, kind of healthcare slowness, slowness mapped on your uh, environment, you can then say, okay, there are there are different games that we can play in some of these different areas where we can move a little bit faster, or we know that we can apply some different principles and, you know, swapping one component for another, or, um, you know, delivering a specific service in a different way. Um, a great example of a customer that I'm working with right now, they monitor um, hearts. So they, they have a, um, a halter monitor that attaches to the chest and takes a, a, a what's called an ambulatory ECG. So it takes the bump, the bump, the bump of the heart as, as people are going around on their normal day-to-day uh, -day life. Um, they switched to a postal service from an in-clinic practice. So they've gone from something where you know a clinician would be attaching the thing to your chest and making sure it was all okay and sending you out the door uh, to something where they can mail the patient the, the, the patch directly. That's a change in the way that they're delivering the service, but it's not really a change in the service itself. And, and that one environment, that clinical environment, is quite um, uh, specifically, um, it's not regulated, but there's specific clinical practices that you can't really change that are general to that clinical environment. But obviously, if you're posting something to somebody, that's a different environment. And there are other things that you can do there that will uh, allow you to adapt the service in different ways and actually deliver it faster, for example. Um, so the more constraints that you have on your environment and, and the more you've identified them and defined them and, and maybe sort of drawn boxes around some of the components or, you know, however you want to do it, that then allows you to think through, okay, there are certain things I can't do in that area and I just have to live with that. And, and maybe there's a longer term strategy that you'd apply to those kind of areas. And then in those other areas where you do have more degrees of freedom, you can say, okay, I've got a broader remit here to do something what are all those different things I could do here? And, and are there ways that I can avoid those slower moving areas? Um, and, and that's one of the things I think is a nice framework uh, for thinking is it gives you that ability to say, you know, there are, there are complete areas here which we can't really touch, but there are other areas where we can modify things and you, you can structurally um, define them. You can share them amongst other people in the business and different people in different parts of the business will have different ideas about what you can and can't do in those different areas. And particularly if you're talking to people on the front line, uh, you know, who are actually within clinic, um, quite often there are things where they say, you know, if you could just get rid of this, you know, this, this questionnaire that we do up front, you know, we, 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 we hardly ever use it. It's, it's only used for like 2% of patients, but we need the data on each and every patient. Well, do you need to do that in clinic or is that something you could collect 
electronically beforehand, or is that something you could collect after, or other other places you could get that same information? Um, it allows you to ask all those different questions, and I think that's really really valuable when you then think about okay, what what are the strategic plays that I could you know bring to bear? What are those you know climactic patterns that are going to affect this service? Are there other things coming in from left field that I need to be aware of that could change the game here completely. So if I could reflect back or mm. try and summarize what you just said there, that the, the key benefits are situational awareness is, is, is the one, but also you're finding um, the optimization aspect useful to play what mm. if uh, gains, if you like, and also yeah. It sounds like the spend control as well that you're looking at. The bit I'm interested in, which I didn't really understand, is that your, the anticipation work that you're doing with Wardley mapping. Mm. Uh, it's, for somebody who's not, although I do have experience of pharmaceutical, it's a long time ago, and I'm sure people are watching, um, it would be a, a similar situation. Is there anything that you can summarize around how you use Wardley mapping to anticipate in health and clinical? Uh, clinical sector. Yeah, and I, I guess this is interesting as it's kind of topical in some ways, right, as well, is there's a lot going on in this area uh, where something has come out of the blue entirely unanticipated. And, and, and I think that's, that's one of the interesting things that is very difficult to capture on Wardley maps are those kind of black swan type things. Um, in, if I go back to kind of radiology, we know that there are um, patterns of development within radiology that are very, very similar to, for example, software development or hardware development. Um, the power of a machine, the fidelity of a scan, the amount of data that you can see in a scan improves year over year. And obviously the technologies and things change. Ultrasound is quite low resolution. MRI, increasingly higher resolution and cardiac MRI uh, is, is incredibly high resolution and then you've got sort of PET CT and stuff. You know that these things are becoming more detailed and, and um, more refined over time. The, the, the software is getting better. You also know that they're becoming cheaper and more accessible. So there's a greater range of conditions for which these things uh, could be applied. So if we look at the, um, the test for COVID-19 right now, entirely topical, um, a PCR test, which is that, you know, is, is the virus there by looking for the RNA uh, 20 years ago that would have probably been ruinously expensive to deploy at scale uh, these days it's, it's very cheap and we know that that is going to become increasingly commodity over time um, there's some very good evidence that uh, chest CT is an even better sensitivity in the early stages of the disease um, and that taking a, a CT scan of the chest through regular um, hardware that people already have is, is a potentially use of useful diagnostic as well. Um, now, CT scans 10 years ago would have been quite expensive. Um, increasingly, CT machines are much less expensive. Uh, if there's a way of doing that with ultrasound, you know, you could have that in the field with, in a device that's 300 pounds or something. So you know all of this stuff is becoming cheaper and that as a, a, a new scan becomes available, within the price bracket of a certain treatment. So um, let's say, for example, you've got prostate uh, cancer. So in the field of oncology, um, people have been trying to uh, address prostate cancer in a number of different ways. You can do guided exams uh, where you have a sort of CT or MRI type machine involved at the same time while you're treating the patient so you can see what you're doing, or you can have some kind of unguided treatments and things. As all of those scans become cheaper, you're going to want to do the guided stuff more often because you've got a better idea of what's going on and, and a better treatment rate. Um, so you can look at, okay, let's say an MRI or a PET CT might be quite ex expensive to do right now, but in five or 10 years time, it won't be as expensive. What are those treatments that could then involve an MRI or a PET CT? And then, you know, if, if you do have some new treatment option, um, the, is that going to involve existing things or is that going to be new? In the area of prostate cancer, they have these new um, proton beam therapies and very guided ways of uh, attacking um, cancer cells. Again, new technology, but kind of building on stuff that people are already doing. There's a lot of interest and um, work going on in these sort of various guided beam therapies. And you can say, actually, in the future, there are other therapies that will be developed, or you can look at the research that's going on right now and actually see them being developed in real time. 
and then say, okay, if we had that in our clinic right now, what would that change? You know, what, what would we be doing? Would we have new equipment? Are there new specialisms that we would need to have in terms of the staff? Are there different ways that we would treat patients? Are there different types of patients that we could access? And all of that information I think is quite valuable because when you're building up a picture of, okay, what is our service gonna look like in five years time? Um, you've got the regular things of capacity. What is my local patient population? How many people are gonna get sick? Is this a, you know, a recurring thing? Is this a condition that's gonna be chronic and that we can expect more people to have in the future? But then you've got all of those things as a kind of, okay, we don't have this now, but what if uh, new therapies, new types of, um, uh, you know, ways of treating and actually just, you know, plain improved processes and practices are the better clinical pathways, uh, better evidence uh, for how to treat patients and all of that. You can begin to say, okay, you know, let's let's put that on the map. Let's let's show what's happening to these components, or whether there are new components appearing, and let's talk about what that then looks like. Um, and and you can't anticipate everything. Absolutely, I think it's very difficult to say that you should be drawing diagrams with multiple unknown <laughs> diseases and all that kind of stuff. But you can also begin to say, okay, you know, we we. We, we will plan for things like, you know, having a tenfold spike on our, um, on our, on our, on our capacity requirement. And, and, you know, funnily enough, one of my clients is going through uh, that process right now. They deliver a service entirely online. This service, uh, you know, let's say last year could have been delivered face to face or online. They're, they're one of the online players. Lots of other people do it face to face. Right now, you can't really do face to face. Uh, it's quite difficult. So they have had a sudden spike of actually people still need treatment. Online is the only way of getting it. So they now have to cope with all of that increased demand. They're not treating the, the, the COVID-19 directly, but they are uh, experiencing the knock-on effects of people not being able to meet. Um, and, and all of those things, you know, I, I think people are going to be dining out if they are business continuity planners and things or for years on on the COVID-19 stuff oh, um, yes. but yeah. you know you don't even have to go to that degree of change to 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 get meaningful information about what your services and things could look like in a few years because you know 90 percent of what is going to happen I think people can you know reliably predict across the five-year time span. I'm going to gently pull you back now to Wardley Mapping because it's yeah. fascinating what you're saying and we could, just in the interest of time, what I'd like to do now is to move on to and reference your book, actually. And it's an area that interests me, which is lifelong learning. And mm. one aspect of Wardley Mapping I really like is the collaborative nature of it and that really for it to be effective, um, everybody in a team really needs to have a say needs to be able to challenge the map so there's this notion of it's this is area of contention around it at the moment what language should be used but it's mm. almost depersonalizing uh, storytelling so it's everything is funneled through the map so it's not a personal attack um as an aside that's um, there's, there's two as aspects to what I'm going to say. One is obviously lifelong learning. Mm. The other is having a stake in a, a business and a business problem. And when something is mapped out and somebody's been involved on in the team, um, collaborative in, involved with that, I think that is, will lead to a better working environment and ultimately better systems. So when we look ahead at the areas that you're interested in, AI, mm. uh, for example, today maybe not all systems have a component which is AI or interfaces with a system that includes machine intelligence. Yeah. But it's not long before that will be the case. And then you start to think, just because we can build a system, should we build a system? Oh, I, I could uh, reference companies that have been in the news, but I won't do, but everybody <laughs> know what they are. So that, that's, I think, is the long-term benefit of going through the learning curve of Wardley mapping. In the book, we say that it's crucial uh, 
awardly mapping in business that you get all your colleagues on board mm. um, and ideally they must share in the creation and be involved within the map so could you e expand on that and any issues that you see around the uptake of awardly mapping one observation I've got which I'm just testing now is to say that Worldly mapping will be effective, but in companies that embrace action learning. Mm. So all the principles in, or most of the principles of action learning, will, worldly mapping will slot into that. Um, also, just going back to what you said before, I heard you mention that you, you put your components on the map and then you may draw a box around that. If you use any tools that uh, you find improve your productivity that you can share with us that would mm. be interesting too so it's in some ways really about um worldly mapping collaborate collaborative uh, you know, as a group yeah and how you do that effectively yeah and, and and maybe i'll begin by making an even stronger statement than uh, what i wrote in the book which is i think uh you don't necessarily need mapping to be mandated from the top but the the top of an organization absolutely needs to be involved for it to be effective. Um, and I think where, where I've tried to do this, and I, I think I talked about this a little bit in the book, where I tried to do this in the past, you can, you can get some value out of it if you're you know, a product team or a tech dev team or something, and you're using it to communicate amongst yourselves about what you're developing. Um, but it is very, very difficult to go cross um, boundaries within a business into other areas unless everybody has that same skill set and I guess this is one of the sort of both downsides and upsides of the process so the downside to me is that everybody needs to know and understand it and they need to be able to read a map um, and there's a degree of learning that has to take place there and unfortunately that is a little bit of an investment in some ways and and there are people who take a longer time to to really get it um, and, and I think when you're not in a business where there is that learning mentality whether it's called you know lifelong learning or anything else where where people don't adopt new practices and test them out or develop their skills or you know even go for training on a semi-regular basis you just you know people people walk into the business with the tools they know they use them and, and that's it they're not really interested in doing anything uh deeper than that and i think that, that's almost like the downside of it is that there is resistance to learning new stuff like this, particularly when it doesn't seem obvious as to how it's going to deliver value for somebody. And if it isn't something that the C-suite of an organization or the top management or whatever you want to call it are involved with and promoting, it, it, it just doesn't get anywhere. Um, but the flip side of that is that I think if you are in a learning oriented organization and and you do take that awareness and uh the ability to communicate amongst different areas of the business seriously then it is a very very powerful and useful tool because you can immediately distill uh some of what you are trying to do or the problems that you have or the you know the plans that you're wanting to set into motion in a very simple diagram which most people in a business you know should be able to at least understand the principle of even if they're not necessarily in a place where they can contribute and i think there is a difference there between you know consuming a map and understanding what the, the person who's drawn it is trying to tell you about where you're going in the future let's say uh, and and being able to contribute to that idea of what that future strategy might be and i think you know as a great example if you're a ceo of a business if you can show people the components that are in your business in a map they probably know most of the components already. They know, you know, where the competition is and, 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 and what is important, or they should know what's important in the business. And if you can say, look, these three things are important to us. We want to move them in this direction. Let's say we want to make this, you know, this prototype of a thing, a product. We want to take this kind of commodity thing and move it up market. Simple statements like that you can demonstrate that visually people can understand it very simply and they know what you're trying to do and then when you know a salesperson comes along and says hey we, we um we've just sold another one of these custom things to a client you, they can then turn around and say hey but we're not doing custom you know we're, we're trying to turn this into a product and it's supposed to be cookie cutter now right um 
I, I, I haven't seen that being done very often, <laughs> fortunately. And I think that this is where it is really, you either take it as a collaboration tool or you think about it as like a personal framework of uh, analysis. And I think for most people, it is this personal framework of analysis. So I want to think about the environment that I'm in. I want to think about my marketplace. I want to write some of this stuff down. But I'm going to use it as a framework to scaffold my own thoughts. And then probably I'm going to like write up a document and, and send the document around to everybody else. I'm not going to share the map. Well, that's um, interesting. So if I understand you're saying it's both a collaborative tool, but it's also a way of being able to communicate. Yeah, I, 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 think, it, I, I think it has to be because I think unless... The, the collaboration is the most valuable bit of it for me, but you, you're you not going to collaborate if people are reading the same sort of information in different ways. So actually you've got to have that communication in there almost as like the basic skill. And it's, it's a little bit like, I, I, I sometimes liken this to kind of teaching a foreign language, except that like the first step is listening and understanding what you're being given and, and, and having that kind of comprehension before then moving on to being able to talk in the language and being able to write in the language. Um, and I think that's, in a lot of ways, that's kind of how most people learn language as well. And this just happens to be a kind of symbolic <laughs> way of communication as opposed to, you know, like a written thing. But I, I think there's a lot of overlap there and a lot of commonality. One way I've thought about mapping uh, for quite a while is as an emerging soft skill. So. Mm. Probably not the doctrine or the gameplay, but it's the idea of being able to map out a value chain and then look at the motion, the evolution, mm. um, especially in the era of technological change, automation and AI. It's a way of being able to reduce a huge amount of information to symbols, components and flows. Would you agree yeah. with that? I, I, I do. And I, 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 th I think this is always the danger in business in general is that you end up being a little bit reductive of, of you know, anything that's put in front of you. Like if you've got the accounts in front of you, you can turn that into a cash flow forecast and the cash flow forecast is a graph kind of like does that, right? It goes up and up into the right. Um, and, and it's an incredibly simple uh, model and it doesn't necessarily tell you an awful lot about, um, you know, what can happen. I think this is the this is almost the challenge of the map is that it is an abstract relatively um high bandwidth but sort of low information form of communication and it's only by that practice over time of figuring out what are the things that are important and useful and, and what's the noise that you end up refining that into those ideas that are genuinely you know, useful and valuable and worth sharing. And it's, I, I think of it a little bit like um, copywriting, for example. So when you're writing marketing texts for a, a company, the first things that you write are kind of long and wordy and they don't really address the point and they're, they're not concerned with the user. And like you, you end up then talking to people and through those conversations, you refine your marketing text and you figure out what your elevator pitch is and you think about what are the things that are the points that have resonated with people? What are the core essential ideas that turn out to be really useful? And then, you know, in the same way with the maps over time, you start with something that's probably got a lot of fluff in it and you continually adapt it and refine it. And the things that you end up with are highly valuable and incredibly informative. Um, and, and, and that process, you know, you could probably do that with other things other than a map. I think what is nice about a map is that they're kind of malleable in very straightforward ways. And particularly, um, you know, you can have arguments about the position of things, uh, whether or not it's a genuine need, you know, is this a component worth having on the thing at all? And, and those discussions end up being a kind of, you know, a, a why type discussion. Why is this thing there? Why is it we're doing this? Why? why you know why are we trying to create this uh, map of the environment and what are we seeking to achieve um and and it's all of that kind of meta uh that turns out to be i think where the value of it really comes through and and your ability to save all of that meta within the map itself is is the trick to making them you know the the, the valuable tool that they they end up being <laughs>
If you were to meet a team that had no experience of mapping whatsoever, mm. um, how would you go about introducing them to mapping the benefits and perhaps mm. how would you structure a workshop? Well, funnily enough, there's one in the back of my book <laughs> with a pretty basic structure. And, and, and this is actually primarily why I ended up writing some of this stuff, because I wanted to work people up to the point of drawing maps through intermediate forms. Um, and, and so I talked about things like mind maps and value chains and transaction maps and things like that. Um, things that people are probably more familiar with, in, at least in some ways. And while they're not the same tool at all, you can begin to get them from one stepping stone to the other sort of thing. So you can say, okay, let's talk about what use and needs are. Let's just draw a diagram of a, you know, a linear value chain. What are the things that people need? What's what, what, what are our inputs and what are our outputs and, and who's making use of what? Um, and, and, and what is, I think interesting for me is when I've done this with teams in the past, it's actually those basic, um, you know, those, those, those basic uh, processes of thinking through user need and stuff that get them to, um, you know, really talk about what's valuable. Um, if I can, I'll, I'll just show you a screen. I'll talk you through an example I gave with a team uh, just recently. Um, and I'll, I'll start with some background. So the background for this is um, AMD. Uh, so if we cast our minds back to 2015, they are in the middle of a really tough, uh, set of financial figures, loads of things is going wrong. People are writing articles like this, you know, terrible year for AMD. Um, you know, are, are they about to go bankrupt? You know, we've got, we know who their competition are. We've got Intel, Nvidia and all that kind of stuff. Um, th this is a very basic map that I ended up drawing of their environment in, in the sort of 2015 era. And, and this is where I think it's interesting to get teams on board with, um, uh, you know, the, the, the process of mapping in general, because you can say to them, okay, what is your environment? What is, what is your business doing? What are the things that are uh, key to you? And, and within this environment for me, you know, the, the AMD environment, they're making, you know, they're making the GPUs over here. They're making the CPUs down here. They care about people in the cloud and they care about PCs. And to some extent, you know, mobile is happening. Bitcoin is happening. Video games are important. Um, and, and it's actually a relatively complicated environment, even at this kind of high level, because you've got a lot of stuff that's kind of going on. You've got all of the kind of left field stuff. So you've got stuff like AI, cloud consoles, cloud gaming. We're not sure what's going to happen over there. You've got a whole load of constraints down here to do with uh, Moore's law finishing. And, you know, how do we shrink down the next set of CPUs? Where's the next bit of performance going to come from can we even make these things you know you're beginning to butt into the limits of physics and things like that um, and, and just getting a team together to say okay let's map out some of these things you know what are the things that I think you're thinking about you know if you put your, yourself in the boots of your customer what do the cus what what is the customer interested in we've got you know for AMD a bunch of different things here you've got things like Bitcoin and uh, video games and mobile and stuff and then I, I think this is where the interesting conversation then comes is you say, OK, what is it that we think we need to change? What is it that we think we need to do? How do we think we're going to improve the, the business? Um, and here's the challenge with Wardley mapping as well as the benefit, because you can look at this and we can talk about sort of different bits of the strategic gameplay. You know, we know AI is kind of very sort of genesis in the year 2015, but it's going to move over this way. And probably cloud gaming is going to come over here a bit. And, and there's going to be increasing, uh, you know, commoditization of cloud compute. Maybe the PC, you know, is going to um, keep moving down in that kind of direction because it's becoming increasingly less valuable. Fewer people are buying it. Um, you know, it's a, it's a market that's on the wane. Um, you can talk about how all these different components and things are moving. Then you say, actually, given all of that kind of stuff, where, where should we be paying attention? You know, do we pay attention to mobile because that seems to be a big thing in 2015 should we be paying attention to bitcoin because that seems to be a big thing in 2015 um and and uh you know if we talk about what's happening in 2015 um bitcoin i think trades about 200 dollars through most of the year in terms of video games and consoles you've got the uh ps4 and the xbox one that have just come out so you know there's a lot of activity in the console area and stuff 
Um, you've got a lot of different things that you could be doing. And, and that discussion about, you know, what are the projects that are important to us? Where is the value for us as an organization? I think then becomes really um, straightforward because you can look at this and you say, actually, you know, we know that we um, need to work on new chip designs. We need a new node. We need a new process that's going to be even smaller. You know, we need this kind of seven nanometer process. But we also know that's going to be very, very capital intensive. And we know that there are uh, in the sort of chip fabrication area, more and more services now available with more uh, off the shelf products. We've got the likes of TMSC and all of this stuff is kind of going over here. Is it worth us spending any time in that area? No, probably not. You know, you can then look at stuff like Bitcoin. You say, OK, people are selling uh, Bitcoin. It keeps going up in value. We're selling our GPUs like hotcakes. Is it worth trying to do, you know, a custom Bitcoin CPU or something like that? And, and you know, probably you'd imagine that this is going in this direction and maybe it's becoming a bit more visible at the same time. But th th there's a number of different things at play then. You could look at that on a technical level and you say, we think this is probably still going to be quite a slow moving thing. Um, we're not really sure about where it could or should go. Is it worth trying to invest all of that? capital into developing a specific line of chips and things whereas you know ai probably an awful lot more interesting maybe you are or aren't doing something directly with that but you know that that's going to be sticking around for uh, a, a while i think when you're talking to teams and trying to get them on board with wardley mapping this kind of scenario is actually really interesting because you can say you know given this diagram what would you do? Where, where are the things that you would uh, invest or, you know, what would you try to seek to shift? What, what would you um, uh, say is the, you know, the area of interest? Um, and particularly the kind of a semi-historical example like this, and this is AMD in 2015, you can then roll time forwards. And I think this is actually one of the most interesting things in workshops is to say, okay, here's the scenario. Um, and I know, um, like Simon Wardley, when he's done this in the past, he's used examples like Nokia and things like that. I, I think it's sometimes more interesting to use a scenario where people are not sure or wouldn't know readily how things turned out and what the strategy actually was. Because you can war game it and you say, okay, what are the different things that we think are going to be interesting here? Is it going to be cloud compute? And do we put all of our investment down there? Or, you know, is it cloud gaming? Is that where all the action is going to be? And you can have those discussions and then you say, OK, that was 2015. What was the strategy that they put in place and, and where did they end up? And what's really interesting about AMD, um, you know, when when people get into orderly mapping, I think they kind of concentrate on the, the, the top left quadrant because that seems to be where all the interesting stuff is. And, and the general attitude is, you know, that's the area of interest. It's all going to move that way. There's going to be new stuff springing up on top of it. And you kind of need to manage that kind of zigzag process of stuff going up through the map. That's not what AMD did. So AMD doubled down on CPU design. They doubled down on GPU design. And they um, certainly with the GPUs attempted to go a little bit up market. And they certainly attempted to make their CPU stuff a little bit more valuable. They said, we're not going to really care about mobile, even though mobile is super popular right now, we're not really going to do very much. By definition, then, we're not going to chase after performance per watt too much. We know that's of some interest to cloud, and cloud is going to be interesting to us still, but we're, we're going to focus on actual raw performance. And if you're looking at that, you'd say, why would you do that? Because the PC market, you know, the marketplace for these GPUs and stuff is kind of in decline. Mobile is where stuff is at. And uh, when you're looking at the kind of end of Moore's law type stuff, are you really going to get all of the benefit out of this um, underlying, uh, you know, physics constrained chip manufacture that is going to make that a worthwhile bet? Um, now, if you look at the history of how AMD have done um, and they've just brought out their you know, new Ryzen series uh, in, in the past few months, really, They've done extremely well. You know, that that play of let's focus on uh, CPU and GPU and just double down on that stuff. Um, and, you know, to some extent, they're, they're playing with consoles still. We've got another um, set of consoles coming out next year or maybe even the end of this year. 
Um, they, they are not in the small scale space. They're not in the mobile space. They're not trying to make uh, things ultra performant. They're not trying to compete with ARM or anything like that. They're, they're just doubling down on, on raw performance. And to some extent you can say, okay, they've also been lucky because Intel, you know, they screwed up their chip fab uh, work to some degree. Intel have been trying to get their 10 nanometer node out for you know, best pay most of that five years. They, they, they've, they've relied to some extent on their competitors dropping the ball somewhat. But actually there's a really interesting strategy where if, if, if they were AMD, you know, kind of looking at this map, what they're actually saying is let's, let's look at those areas where we feel we have strength. We know that our strength isn't mobile. We think our strength could be GPU. We're definitely strong in CPU. We're definitely strong in PC. We're definitely strong in console. We're somewhat strong in cloud, but we're not really strong in cloud. Um, and to some extent, they've kind of ignored the stuff that's going on up there as a kind of, you know, that will happen as, as and when. Bitcoin, I, th I think, is a really interesting gamble because they would have been selling like hotcakes in uh, 2015. And they kind of ignored it. And, you know, what happened, as we all know, with Bitcoin in 2018 was that there was this massive glut of uh, GPUs on the market. And actually, the, the, the bottom fell out of that. There's a lot of oversupply. Certainly would not have been interesting to have, you know, develop some kind of, uh, you know, Bitcoin specific chip and start linking that down into chip design, and all the rest of it, that would have been a horrendous waste of capital. Um, so now looking back on it, uh, in, in 2020, we can then say, what were the factors that came up that made this play work? You know, it's not necessarily obvious from a 2015 view, you know, viewpoint that CPU and GPU is the interesting place to be. It's, you know, it's not necessarily obvious that Bitcoin is going to fail. It's not necessarily obvious that cloud gaming isn't working out for whatever reason. But you can then run those scenarios, right? And you can say, okay, what are the things that we've learned over that period of time? And what were those um, pieces of information that we could have used to predict all of that? What, what, what are the signals either in the marketplace or in the technology? What are the things that with hindsight we can now say uh, made that a successful strategy? And I think... Um, I, I'm trying to remember what their share price was at the time. It maybe was around the, the, the two or five buck mark in 2015. And then now, you know, I, I think in the last couple of years, they've been one of the best performing stocks uh, on, 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 the, on the marketplace. Now, stock price isn't everything, obviously. But you could say that going from a company that was at the point of bankruptcy, arguably in some ways in 2015, to one which is now in a position to comfortably outcompete a lot of their competitors, that's a very, very interesting change over that period of time and trying to understand that play through sets of maps and developing maps, uh, I think is one of the best ways of trying to understand, you know, what works and what doesn't within a Wardley map, because you can, you're not just trying to predict the future, you're, you're, you're kind of taking a few steps back, making some predictions and then seeing if those predictions checked out in reality. Well, that's fantastic, Alex, to was around the uh, and be provided with a, some perspective on the AMD story. Mm. So, um, how can people stay in tune with you? Do you have a blog or a? Yeah, I I do. I um, I blog much less frequently than I'd like to, uh, but my blog is alexhudson.com, which is very straightforward. Uh, my Twitter handle tends to be where most of the action is at, and that is at the Alex Hudson. So there's an E on the front of that, um, which is my uh, first name. And um, at some point in the next few months, I'm also trying to do another revision of the uh, introduction to Wardley mapping book. Um, basically, what I'm trying to do with it is make it a resource for people who are doing these workshops, who are trying to get particularly their C-suite type, uh, you know, business colleagues introduced to this in a very straightforward, you know, nuts and bolts way. Um, and it is, uh, it's on Lean Pub. You can grab it for free or you can um, uh, put a bit of money uh, toward, toward the next edition. Um, and I'm hoping to get that out probably uh, summertime, uh, all, all, all things being equal. Um, and uh, yeah, so... Well, thank you again for taking the time and sharing so much information. It's been fantastic. Oh, you're more than welcome. It's been a great conversation. Thanks, John. Okay, then. Bye. Cheers. <laughs>